Rock Springs. I'm Terry. Is this, can you hear me? Closer? Oh. Okay, I'm going to give a brief description of my life that may help everyone understand my journey up until now. I'm terrible at speaking in front of people, so bear with me. As a child, I never went to church and was totally ignorant of the Bible and the teachings of Jesus Christ. As I grew, the confusion and feeling of became, being lost was normal. From adolescence through my adult life, I tried ways to find happiness without any luck. If I would have just known, it wasn't about luck. How did I come to know Jesus as my forgiver? I don't remember an all at once flip the switch, I'm saved moment. I would just tell you about one person who had a tremendous impact on my life and belief in God. Tiffany was not my biological daughter, but I called her daughter and she called me dad. Tiff went through things that no one should even before being diagnosed, diagnosed with cancer. The four and a half years that followed seemed to be nonstop treatments, surgeries, and physical pain for her, yet her faith didn't seem to waver. As I grew angry inside, Tiff prayed for me. As I filled with depression, Tiff prayed for me. I couldn't understand at the time that her strength came from her love and trust in God. Then, in July 2020, my granddaughter passed. Lonnie and I were close. She was my little helper. Lonnie always wanted to do whatever I was doing, from playing a game to working in the shop. She was right at my side. So it probably goes without saying that at this point, I felt totally broken. Even though Lonnie and Tiff were also very close, Tiff saw my pain and she prayed for me. As time went on and Tiff knew she didn't have a lot of time left on earth, she would worry about her mom and I. Then she would reassure us she was going home and she would just point to the heavens. When Tiff did pass six months after Lonnie, I was in a new kind of low place, trying to turn emotions completely off so that nothing would hurt again. It was one more way I failed at doing things my way. Still missing them, both girls, more than I could put into words, I knew in my heart it was time to try something different for me, for my family, and for my girls in heaven. My brain likes to argue, but my heart knew I had to be strong, like my daughter, and realize I'm not the one in control. God is in control and has all the power, deserves all the glory. With everything I've said here, there's so much more I haven't, but it's a big part of getting baptized today. I felt God pulling me to be baptized and give my testimony because I felt it was the next step in my relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done for us and everything to come. We give you the glory. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here and listening to my testimony. Good job, sir. <laughs> Strong testimony, and I'm, I'm proud of you for being brave enough to be scary people. I'm just telling you for sure. Yeah. God's doing something in Chantilly's life as well. Would you say, hey, Chantilly? You ready? Okay, here we go. You guys are really scary, just so you know. <laughs> and then to follow that, like, I don't know. It's fine. <laughs> All right, so good morning. My name is Chantilly. Um, maybe you're like me. I grew up going to church at a very young age. I was typically brought to church by my grandparents and my aunts who are here. On occasion, uh, my parents would attend. As I got a little older, I started participating in missionettes, a Bible study class designed for elementary age girls. I eventually started riding the bus to church every Wednesday. 
I had some amazing cousins, Tiffany, of course, and my other little cousin, Logan. Um, I always looked up and admired their strength and belief in the Lord, but I never really knew how I could get there. Growing up, I was loved dearly, and my parents never failed to show me that they loved me. I was taken care of and never neglected, but at the same time, my childhood was also very traumatic. Lots of drugs, alcohol, partying, and fighting. I won't go into great detail, but I can remember going to church every Wednesday and praying for my family that they would find Jesus. Being so young, I didn't really understand why God wouldn't just step in and make everything better. That's what he's supposed to do, right? <laughs> well, that's what I thought um, as a little kid, which oftentimes led me to questioning God. I stuck strong and still continue to believe, even though my circumstances weren't changing. It was around the age of 12 that I decided to get baptized. I thought at that time I truly knew exactly what it meant, that it was, that, or, and that's also what I was supposed to do. It was very exciting, but I had no idea what the rest of my life had in store for me, what 12-year-old does. As I got older, I attended church less and less. During my high school years, my church attendance became non-existent, except for some occasional holiday visits. I found myself going in every wrong direction, and then came the drugs, alcohol, and partying. This lifestyle continued throughout all of my 20s and into my early 30s. Throughout this time, I tried to get back into attending church more often, but when I did attend, I, resent, I had resentment toward everyone there because they seemed to have a better relationship with God than I did. That was my excuse to not go back. I just felt like I would never get to the place of having a deep relationship with God, so what was the point? I later went on and got married to my wonderful husband, and we had two little girls who are with us today. <laughs> I wish I could say that's when my life turned around and I just became a Christ follower, but it wasn't. I continued to drink and party despite having two little girls looking up to me. I knew in the back of my mind that I needed to do better and that, is when my, or, and that it was my responsibility to teach them about Jesus. But how could I show them when I didn't even know myself? I desperately wanted them to know God, so I did the only thing I knew how, and that was to start taking them to missionettes and hope they would learn what they needed to, to know there. I would occasionally stay for Bible study and would feel so much better when I did, but it didn't last. Something was just missing. Then one day, my husband found Rock Springs. He told me, maybe we should try to go to church there. And so we did and loved it. We attended Celebrate Recovery for a while. It wasn't anything consistent until about six months ago. That's when every Sunday became church day. <laughs> now I can hardly wait until the next Sunday to go back. <laughs> we started digging in more and more, and now God isn't just a Sunday mention. We jam out to Christian music, and we even have a whole VeggieTales playlist that we can all recite in their voices. <laughs> it feels good to finally be leading our girls by example. A couple months ago, I was sitting in Sunday worship service, right over here somewhere, and thinking to myself, man, God is just so good. I wish I could just get on a rooftop and just scream it out loud so everyone just knows and can hear me. <laughs> And just so that they could realize. Um, and then that's when I realized that I needed to get baptized. I needed to bury my old life and begin a new life through Jesus. The following week, Pastor David mentioned that a baptism celebration was coming up soon. Coincidence? No, it's probably God's timing. <laughs> so here I am today to publicly say that I believe in God and trust him as my Lord and Savior. <laughs> so strong. Thank you. Oh, man, that makes me want to preach. Yeah. Thank you, Chantilly, for sharing that. also highlights why RSK and RSY, trying to help our students. It's not babysitting, not just trying to come up with fun things. It matters, so thanks for sharing that. This next guy, his name's Tim. Everybody say, hey, Tim. <laughs> if you need anything fixed, he can probably do it. But um, here's the thing about him is he's usually down here in the splash zone even when we're not baptizing. So, Tim, come on up and uh, share your story with us.
Hello, church. Um, my name is Tim McDell. I was born in 1963 in Phoenix, Arizona, and my parents were primarily Baptists, and we attended church pretty regularly, mostly at the same church until we moved to Cortez in 1973. And I turned 10 years old, 10 years old that summer, and life was pretty good. I made new friends and started skiing that next winter, and I love skiing, and I still do. Uh, Mom and Dad really never settled into a permanent church. We bounced around a few different ones, and we actually stopped going all together, which was fine with me because then I could ski Saturday and Sunday during the ski season. So summer before my sophomore year, my parents divorced. My dad had moved to Phoenix, and I stayed in Cortez with my mom. I never seen or spoke to my dad for almost 17 years. He just kind of disappeared on me. So it was extremely hard um, not having my dad around growing up because he'd always been a really good father. So growing up as a teenager, I was pretty, pretty wild. My mom knows that. My mom, she didn't have much control of, over me. <laughs> I pretty much did whatever I wanted. I was smoking pot, drinking and partying with my friends. Um, I got married in my early 20s, had this beautiful little girl named Jessie and I just love being Jesse's dad. But unfortunately, things didn't work out for me and her mom, and we divorced, and Jesse and her mom had moved to California, and it was a really sad time for me, but I've always had a good relationship with Jesse, and I've got three wonderful little grandkids and a great son-in-law, and I'm a proud grandpa, and they call me Papa T. After, <laughs> after the divorce, I met Pastor Jimmy Kennedy, and him and his wife, had invited me to, to their house for dinner, and that night in their kitchen, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I was attending church, but after a while, I wasn't really living life as a Christian, and I stopped going to church, and my life had a lot of ups and downs, went through a few relationships, nothing really substantial. I pretty much worked, did my own thing. So time goes on. So from there to close to about a year and a half, I've been attending church here at Rock Springs, um, I started a new relationship with Jesus and trusting him. I have since then met my love, Renee, and we have both been regularly attending church here along with, with Brittany, her daughter, and I couldn't be happier. I love to come to church, and I look forward to the men's group and fellowship with my brothers and sisters here. And with that being said, knowing that Christ, he lived and he died for my sins, my past present and future and he rose from the dead and lives again like pastor says I'm going with that guy <laughs> so I choose to be baptized to show my love for Jesus and God and let it be known to, that I am a cross Christ follower and proud to show it thank you if that doesn't light your fire then your wood's wet that's all I got to say I will also tell you, hidden in there, when you mentioned Jimmy Kennedy, see the legacy of a godly man or a godly woman, Jimmy Kennedy was the pastor who led the church that handed off the keys to this building. He was the one who made sure this building got built, and we're very grateful to him. He's already in heaven, and we're, we'll see him one day. So, yeah. And then there's Sandy. Come on up here, Sandy, would you? Now, she asked me, is like, is my son Scott on the baptism team because he may come in here and sabotage the whole thing? <laughs> Sandy, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. My real name is Clasandra. I go by Sandy or Grandma. <laughs> I was born in Laramie, Wyoming. I was the only child of Edwin and Arlene G. I was probably more of a daddy's girl than a mom's girl. Um, I love being outside, animals, hunting, fishing, finding uh, insects. Um, I would ride out to Annis with my dad to the oil fields. And while he worked, I would try to catch the wild horses. We moved to Cortez in December of 1956 during the oil boom. I was nine years old. A couple of months after we arrived, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. 
My parents went to Denver for her surgery. I remained in Cortez with a family friend. A few days after mom's surgery, a lady told mom's friend, women don't survive that form of cancer. My dad arrived home that night and I told him I was upset. He said, put his hands on my shoulders. He looked me in the eye and he said, Sandy, God will never give you more than what you can handle. I believed him. A few days later, the test came back. All of mom's cancer was in one lump and she was fine. Two years later, my dad had two heart attacks. Those events form my personality. I didn't have anyone to talk to. I was an only child. Um, I became a person that was always happy around everybody. Everything was fine. Because I was afraid if mom and dad knew I had problems, that I could lose them, that I'd be left alone in this world. So I would go out and I would put my head in my horse's neck and he understood. The summer I was 13, I went to church camp and I became emotional and I went out and sat in the woods and I shed a few tears and suddenly I hear Jesus and he said, Sandy, you are not alone. You're going to be just fine. I married my husband, Don, in 1965. He has cared for me and loved me for 58 years. Now, would you give him a clap because he deserves it. I knew then that I would never be alone again. The next three years blessed us with a daughter, Stacy Gallagher, and a son, Scott Story. Our world revolved around them. We watched them grow into wonderful adults and amazing parents, and they have so much joy. They blessed us with six grandchildren and now one great-grandchild. In 1972, my mom had open heart surgery. Following the surgery, when we got to the hotel, I was upset. And once again, my dad put his hands on my shoulders and says, Sandy, God never gives us more than what we can handle. Two hours later, he had a heart attack. I had him in intensive care in one floor, mom intensive care in another floor. But that time, I had to handle it by myself. In 1974, we bought the ranch that we all live on now. And it was always my dream. Give me a horse and a few cows. We had good years. We had bad years. In 1978, uh, or 98, we bought a large cattle permit, and we were running 350 mama cows. But the drought of 2002-2003 forced us to sell our cattle and part of our land. For a long time, I felt lost. The ranch was what I lived for. This is what my whole dream had been. I finally went out one day, and I was setting and I asked God, why am I here? What's my, why am I here? Why, I don't have what my life was. And he gave me some time to grieve. And then one day I found my reason. And it's the best job in the world. It, can you run the girls to school? This one gets off at 3, and that one gets off at 4, and be sure and let Lucas out. <laughs> and there's not a better job in the world than taking care of your grandkids. You know, we've got to watch them grow up. We've got to watch them love animals. 
we've got to watch them deal with what happens out in the country. For years, I thought about getting baptized, but I didn't know the force of why I wanted to get baptized. There had to be a reason, and I didn't feel worthy. There are two things that held me back. One happened 20 years ago. We were on a family trip, and I was pushing my mother in a wheelchair all over Disney World. She told me she was cold, and I snapped at her, and I said, well, put your hood up. I knew I hurt her feelings. I never apologized. She passed away two or three months later. The second thing I have trouble with is I cheated my family and myself. I, I taught my kids to be strong. I taught them to believe in themselves, and they are successful adults, great parents, and I succeeded in that. But I didn't say enough I love yous. I didn't give enough tight, tight hug. And I never stopped to listen. If somebody had a problem, okay, we got to figure it out. We'll find some way to handle this. I kept my emotions inside. I guess what I'm saying is I should have realized I didn't have to be strong all the time. I want to thank Dave Pastor, or <laughs> Pastor Dave for this. He said, you know, you need to learn a little more about grace. <laughs> Something happened recently that has changed my testimony. One night I was saying my prayers to God. I asked him to bless and protect my family and to guide them. I prayed for friends, our country, the weather. And then a voice said, what prayer do you have for you? And I said the one I always say. God, please give me the strength to handle whatever I have to handle. And that wasn't the one I needed to pray. What I realized was lacking in my prayers is God wants me to ask him for guidance to help me figure out how to handle things, not for me to handle it on my own. I need to let God take the wheel. After knowing what Jesus went through to give me forgiveness, I know now that I am worthy. I want to thank and praise him for giving me the opportunity to be baptized in his name. I hope that when my time comes, I will be welcomed into heaven with a real tight hug and the words, welcome home. Thank you. All about the relationships, one another and with God. Thank you, Sandy. And then there's Jim. Come on down, Jim. Come on, y'all. Everybody say, hey, Jim. Just so you guys know you're not scary, you're terrifying. Uh, I think Pastor Dave has me going last because he doesn't want nobody in that water after what's washed away from me. Hello, everyone. My name is Jim. Um, my life has been a series of traumas from my childhood, my time in the Marines, and a lifetime of alcoholism. It has caused me to have severe PTSD, relationship issues, a distrust of everyone, including God, as well as mental health issues. In early 2023, after attending a 30-day mental health program through the VA, I attended my first Celebrate Recovery meeting. At this time, I was a wreck. I tried to kill myself three months before. I had no idea where my life was going. I was disabled, on the verge of being homeless, and about to lose all contact with my daughter. I had already wrecked my relationship with my sons, my daughters, and my wife. I went to church one Sunday, then I decided to attend Celebrate Recovery as well as Sunday services the following week. During those times, I could feel God's calling, but my mind was nothing but confusion. I 
I will never forget the next Wednesday. I was alone in my little room that I considered a cell. I decided I was done. No one would find me this time, save me, or even care. So I got my pain pills and then wrote a letter to my wife and a letter to my daughter. I still have those letters. I was sad, alone, hurt, very angry, and I turned it all on God. I started yelling at him and cursing him and challenged him to do something, just anything. I threw my Bible across the room like I had so many times before in my anger. I wanted to shred it. I wanted to shred it like I had before. But when I reached to pick it up, I saw the verse that says, "God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, so we could be saved." John 3.16, that well-known verse, that's what I saw. I started crying and a peace came over me. I fell to my knees to pray, but the prayer I said, those weren't my words. I could have never even imagined them. I'm not that smart. But in that moment, I surrendered my will and every aspect of my life to God, and I begged him to guide me wherever he wanted me to go. When I said I, amen, my mind was clearer than it had ever been. I had a peace in my heart I had never known. I have to tell you humbly about what happened next. Almost immediately, I started receiving blessings. I found a permanent home, an awesome job. I began receiving healing of my body and my mind. In the mess of my relationships, I found power for reconciliation and important conversations with my family. In fact, my wife and I are building a new foundation together now based in Christ and seeing what God's will is for us. Some people doubted this instant change in my life. Two of them are sitting in this room. <laughs> but now they agree with me a miracle has happened in my life. I'm getting baptized today because when I was in the at the very bottom of my life, the point where I didn't want to go on, when I had no hope and no strength left in me to fight, God saw it was time, and he showed me his love and grace, and he gave me his strength. I want every to, everyone to know his blessings and his compassion that he has bestowed on me. Honestly, I didn't find the Lord. He found me. And he pulled me out of my own private hell and gave me a life I couldn't have dreamed of on my own. Like Psalms 40 verse 2 says, I was sliding down into the pit of death and he pulled me out. He brought me up out of the mud and dirt. He set my feet on a rock. He gave me a firm place to stand on. So I want to be baptized today to let every know, one know I belong to Jesus. He is my forgiver and my leader and my strength. Thank you. It just never gets old. I, because there is only one way to God. Jesus made that very clear. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But there are a lot of paths that lead us to Jesus. Because this is a whole array of different ways that God's been speaking to people. And I'm very grateful. One of the things that we ask of you guys and others who have gone before you, tell your stories because I can get up here and talk and I'm the professional. It's like there's always a bit of doubt in your mind that I've got some ulterior motive. But these people just told you their relationship with God. They have nothing to gain and everything to lose by standing up in front of you. If you are on a journey still trying to figure out life and your purpose, I hope that you could see yourself in some of their stories. And then what I hope is that you will actually take the next step. They're going to be taking the next step here in just a little while. Would you give them another round of applause for their stories? So grateful for the opportunity to share this with you today because we are celebrating. And yeah, I know, I can take all the ridicule that you should be wearing your sunglasses to, you know, <laughs> knock down the... Yeah, the uh, reflection off my legs, but if you're focused on my legs, you're focused on the wrong thing today, so. Amen. Correct. We are celebrating changed lives. We're talking about being redeemed, meaning that we once were lost and then someone paid a very high price to get us back. We're saved because 
we were going down for the last time. And I don't care if it was in a particular place or a particular time. Without Jesus, you and I are liable. We are liable to pay for all the mistakes and sins that we have committed. And the fact is, we can only pay for one. And I'm pretty sure, no offense to anyone in the room, pretty sure y'all are experienced sinners. I think you've gone beyond one. There you go. And then to contrast that with what Paul said, that you exchange your unrighteousness for Jesus' righteousness, and then he gives you his righteousness, and he took the blame and the payment. Oh, yeah. Baptism. There's a weird word. Yep. It comes from a Greek word, baptizo. A lot of words from other languages get that way. It's just you just hear the word. And they transliterate it into English. So that's how we get baptized, baptizo. It sounds all so super spiritual, and it's really not. It's a word that means to dunk or dip underwater. That's it. In fact, one of the earliest references we can find in ancient documents is that's how cucumbers go from being cucumbers into being pickles. Because there's a Greek recipe for pickles. That's, I'm serious. And you baptizo the cucumber in hot water. So That's why I just want to take a few minutes. Like, what is this going on? See, before Jesus showed up, the Jewish people would baptize themselves, go into a mikvah to make a commitment to God, to rinse off and uh, to start anew. Then this guy by the name of John the Baptist showed up, and he started doing a baptism of repentance, meaning changing a direction. And it was very public. Jesus went into that water and he was baptized so that we could see what it looks like to obey God, to turn. He had no sin, but he was obedient to God. And then he said, keep doing that with other people. But it reminds me of a funny story because I'm a fourth generation pastor. And a couple of generations back, my granddad was in the Frio River baptizing people. Because the church that they had in the little community down there, you know, down in uh, south central Texas. They didn't have a built-in facility, kind of like us, and they didn't have this, you know, jacuzzi for Jesus like we got. Um, So they gathered down by the river, and if you've ever been in the Frio River, you know why it's called the Frio River. Um, But he was inviting recent Christ followers to come down into the water, and then along comes Mrs. Fremont, and Mrs. Fremont, my granddad said, because he was a writer, and he wrote about this experience. He said Miss Fremont was a sweet lady, and she was rather portly. Okay. No offense, he was just describing her. Okay. But a couple of need-to-knows about Miss Fremont is that she fearlessly professed Jesus as her forgiver and leader, but she had an irrational fear of water. So, on her own, without telling anybody, she had positioned an inner tube, a small inner tube around her middle, which was covered up by the flowing baptismal robe that she chose to wear that day, and by her portliness. Okay, so. So, my granddad did what you're supposed to do as a preacher, and he spoke the solemn words, was about to baptize her, and he actually did begin to immerse her in the river. And as he slowly lowered her upper portion down into the water, that's when the life-saving device that she had hidden under her robe started kicking in, and that's when Mrs. Fremont's lower portion popped up (laughs) out of the water. (laughs) It's really happened, y'all. I'm just telling you. My granddad said, was I surprised? He said, that was the understatement of the year. But he said, I tried to remain calm. And I focused on completely submerging Mrs. Fremont, so I swiftly let go of that end and just smoothly pushed down her feet and her legs. But he said, David, physics prevailed and up popped her head and shoulders again. (laughs) And he said, I didn't know what was going on, and she looked really confused. So he said, without thinking, I reached over and quickly pushed her under again. And as if that weren't enough, and I don't know if this part was true, but because my granddad was, well, anyway, precious, precious man of God. He said, as meaningful as that baptism drama 
uh, was. He said the preferred direction of baptizing with their head upstream, because it keeps you from getting water in your nose. He said the preferred direction of head upstream became reversed, and in that moment the flow of the river caught the hem of her robe, and that proceeded to invert it over her head. <laughs> and when that happened, then everyone could see what was actually causing this unforgettable baptism <laughs> experience. Okay. For a couple of reasons, I wanted to tell that story because often we have these funny experiences attached to very serious things, but also we all often have funny ideas that surround particularly this ritual that uh, seemingly religious people practice. So we have tried to minimize the unexpected stuff. We don't have to worry about some of the river issues, but um, yeah. But some funny ideas. Some people have said, well, it has to be done at a specific age. It was like, not according to God's word. Uh, some funny ideas. And I think each one of us have talked about this at some, po some point. There is nothing uh, spiritual about that water. It's nice and warm, but it's not spiritual. It does not wash away your sins. The blood of Jesus has already done that. And then there's this funny idea that if you don't do it, God won't give you salvation. Well, I don't know how you explain the thief on the cross who Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. And some of you are going, because I didn't want to get baptized anyway. Nah, he didn't say don't do that. He just said keep on believing, keep on trusting, keep on obeying, and that's where we're at. So let me hit some things to replace all the, the weird stuff with the truth. The truth of the Bible shows us that baptism is like the uniform of the Christian life. Whenever you go into the water and you're saying, I profess Jesus as my forgiver and leader, and I believe that he is who he says he is and that he will do what he said he will do, what you're doing is you're identifying with Jesus. I'm on Jesus' team. That's why we call it going public. Sure, you can believe in Jesus in the privacy of your own home, but there's no evidence in the New Testament that we're supposed to be private believers. It's going public in your following and in your pursuit of him because of his. he has a passionate love for you and he longs for you to be well and whole. He, he longs for you to be forgiven and free. He's done everything that he needs to do in order to make it possible for you to be a friend of God. And so Jesus waded into the middle of this messy world and managed to not sin but at the start of his public ministry, he waded into a river, was baptized, and then at 33 years of age or so, at the conclusion of his sinless life, he willingly allowed himself to be nailed through his hands and his feet and pinned to a cross, not to inspire or to be a martyr, but literally to die. Because it is that shedding of the blood as a sacrificial lamb that he paid and covered all of your sin, mistakes, and evil, and all those things. He did that. He allowed himself to be buried, to be placed in a borrowed tomb, and then to do what he said he was going to do, and that is to be resurrected by the awesome power of God. So, if you see what he did... That's in slow motion over years. In just a moment, you see three different things. He was alive, he was dead, and buried, and then he was raised up to new life. Just before he left earth and said, I've taught you everything you need to know, he told his closest followers, now go and tell them what I've told you. Give them this good news that God's not mad at you anymore. And when they believe that and you start teaching them the habits and skills that I've taught you, I want you to baptize them and then keep on teaching them what they need to grow and then tell them to keep on doing the same. Now, when you and I, in our faith, accept that gift of having our past forgiven, a reason for living, and a home in heaven, that's good news. That it is given by God, it is not earned by all the good things that we feel like we could do. It is literally bought 
and paid for, lock, stock, and barrel by Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, that's when we step into, and I'm talking to you five and all the rest of us as well, you're stepping into a responsibility. Not to keep yourself saved, but a responsibility to respond in gratitude for what he's done. Paul wrote in Romans 6, he said, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You see his death, and it's not because of our death, but we have to die to ourselves in order to live to him. That's what Paul said. He said, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death in order that, this is the purpose, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live, that we may live a new life. See, the straight up instruction is Jesus expects us and he instructs us to put on this uniform. Should be no, we shouldn't be bashful about doing that. What we're doing today is we're reenacting his death, his burial, his resurrection... And it marks your incorporation and it, it, it marks your inclusion into his team, the church, his body. And that way you are now included along with every other redeemed person. See, a lot of people feel like baptism is some sort of graduation ceremony. It's not a graduation ceremony. It's an initiation ceremony. This is the start, man. This is not the end. You have an important role, you have an important responsibility to be in this team, on this team, because you are a part of the church. Everybody got that one? Okay. Second one, the truth that the Bible tells about baptism is like the ID tag, the ID tag of the Christian life. And some of you are going, well, like, isn't the uniform, yes, the same thing as an ID tag, right? It's like, well, it's exactly the same, only different. Yeah, I, I thought it was funny. <laughs> Stayed up late trying to come up with that. Um, a uniform identifies you with a team. But an ID, an ID tag gives you access. And this ID tag is even more personal. Because it's one thing for any of us, whether you're watching online or you're here in person, it is one thing to say, yeah, I respect Jesus. I admire him. I, I might even say I revere Jesus for what he did. He was a wonderful person, an inspiration, a prophet, all those things. But let me tell you something. Admiration is one thing, and it is quite another thing to say, I'm going to lay it on the line because I believe in that man. It's turning the control switch of your life from self-control to Christ control. And at least for us guys, and that's why I just like, if there is no God, how did these grown men come to a saving faith in Jesus? Because whenever you get to be a grown-up man, you're like, you don't want anybody telling you what to do, and you sure don't want to change your mind. Could I get an amen from the women? Oh, no. In Romans, Paul says this. He said, we know that our old self was crucified with him. So that, there's the purpose, so that the body of sin might be done away with. In other words, we've tried it our way for so long, and we got to get rid of that because it is not taking us where we want to go. So that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. No longer be slaves to sin because anybody who's died is freed from sin. You are no longer bound to do what you used to do. You have a new power at work within you. See, the Bible says if you're going to be identified with Christ, you have to die to the old way. It's not the same anymore. He is trying his best in order to replace the old thoughts, the lies that you and I used to believe with the new way. We are dying to the old way of living and we accept his brand new life that he offers. You know, we've been talking about getting a new door uh, someplace here on the building, and I want to go all fancy and have like an ID tag that I can wear, you know, on one of those little, <laughs> that'd be cool. Because that way I can walk up to go, boop, and walk in. I, I don't know. Y'all, you have your own little thing. That just makes me feel so powerful. <laughs> because what would probably happen is I'd get that, and they'd change the code. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you get the point. Okay. I think of an ID tag as that kind of boop gives me access. But let me make it a little bit more blunt. Baptism's kind of like a toe tag.
Just saying. Because that is also an ID tag. And it signifies that the end of your life as you knew it has already come. Listen to the words of the poet from way back in my childhood. In my house there's been a mercy killing and the man I used to be has been crucified. The death of this man was the final way of revealing in a spiritual way to live. I had to die. Now if I let that dead man linger in me, I might get a little idle in my ways. So I'm going down to the Celebration River and I'm going to take this dead man down to a water grave. Mm, is right. Mm. I'm going down to the river and I'm going to be buried alive. I want to show my Heavenly Father that the man I used to be has finally died. Now when I think of where I'm going in terms of where I've been, it makes me glad to know, my Lord, that I have been born again. Could I get an amen? Mm. That is just a poetic way of saying when you're baptized, you're saying, yes, I believe that Jesus died, was buried, came back to life to take away the sin of the world. But I also believe that in order to take advantage of that forgiveness and that power in my own life, I'm going to have to die to my, my way of life. And as Jesus called it, to be born again, to be born again in a new and power-filled life. And that life actually has absolutely no end, and it has already begun. And so in order to illustrate what I believe about Jesus and about my own life, I want to be baptized. We talk about all those days of him being crucified, put in the grave, and resurrecting as his passion, the Passion Week, and so forth. What we're actually saying is, when y'all see me get baptized, this is my passion play. My death. My burial. My resurrection to a brand new way of living. Could I get some mm hmm? One more thing. Truth of the Bible. Truth is, the Bible shows us that bi the baptism is like the wedding ring of the Christian life. Here's what I mean. Let me come at it this way in a flashback. Long time ago, in a land not so far away, a young prince encountered a fair young maiden, which is just a poetic way of saying she's easy on the eyes and fun to be with. Okay? Um, after a whirlwind courtship, he requested her her hand in marriage. I asked her dad, can I have her hand in marriage? He said, don't you want the whole thing? I'm like, I do. I do. Anyway, we love him dearly, don't we, babe? Yep. Anyway, the kingdom rejoiced at the news of their wedding. And as the ceremony progressed, they exchanged solemn and sacred vows in order to, and in order to uh, mark the occasion in a lasting manner. They exchanged rings, which also has my, the date of, that we got married inscribed on the inside so I have no excuse for ever forgetting <laughs> to mark the occasional lasting manner they exchanged rings as a token of their love and commitment to each other and they lived blissfully ever after the end okay most of that story was true the last part was not okay we did exchange solemn vows 41 plus years ago we did exchange rings in order to mark the promises that we made to each other that day and we have not however lived blissfully since that day be and I'll also tell you this, and that certainly wasn't the end. It was the beginning. In a deeper way, if you look at baptism like the wedding ring of the Christian life, when you come to Christ with your sincere faith and your repentant heart, you're entering into a covenant relationship with Him, and it is based on commitments. He is committing to you, and I say commitments, because Jesus will be faithful to his end of the bargain. He said, anyone who comes to me in faith, I won't cast them out. They're welcome. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm good for that. You and I say, well, I want that. He's like, I will forgive you, and I will keep you forever. And he said, and I want you to work at being faithful to that commitment. Not to keep yourself, but in, in gratitude for what I've done. He said, I want you to be faithful to that when everything is blissful and when it's most certainly not. He asks you to follow his lead and to obey his instructions when you understand and when you don't understand. And one of the first instructions he gives to his followers is, be baptized. Just like he was baptized as a simple act of obedience and cooperation with him and what he's doing in your life. 
could go into so many examples. You can read about one where Paul was in jail and God miraculously opened the thing and the Philippian jailer was about to kill himself because he knew he was going to be in trouble because you know, the prisoners were getting out and all that stuff. And he came to know Jesus because of Paul's witness and they went home right then and they baptized. Cool. Cool, cool. Here's another one, Acts 8. Philip, one of the apostles, began with the scriptures because he was just there on the road in this Ethiopian uh, eunuch. Uh, Ethiopian, uh, he was a government official. He was in a chariot and goes by. It's, so, it's a fantastic story. I won't tell it all to you. But Acts 8. Philip began with the scripture, looking at the Old Testament at that time, and told this Ethiopian about the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along and they kept talking about what Jesus had done and how he'd fulfill scripture, they came to some water and the man said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized right now? And Philip said, well, if you believe in Jesus, that he is who he says he is, and he will do what he said he will do, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And the man answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So they got out of that chariot. They went down in the water, and Philip baptized them. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. I said it earlier, but I'm going to say it one more time, because some of you are still thinking this. Some people think that baptism is reserved for people who are good enough. That you have to keep working at it to get good enough, and then you can get baptized. Well, first, let's clear something up. On your own, you will never be good enough, so stop that. It doesn't work that way. Second, as I said, baptism is not a graduation ceremony. It's an initiation ceremony. And just like marriage, when I said I do to that woman, and she said that she would, you know, like I do to me, we did not know what we were getting ourselves into. Because I'm telling you, we were 20-something, young 20-somethings. We didn't have a clue. If, if you're like me, when you got married, did you know all that you were going to have to go through with, with marriage? I mean, it, it's, it's so... I mean, some of it's good, some of it's bad, some of it's just downright ugly. Okay? You didn't know that. But see, it goes beyond the circumstances, and I promised my life to her, and she promised her life to me. We were willing to make that commitment and stand by it, come what may. Being obedient to Jesus is very much the same way. You don't have any ideas of the places he's going to tell you whenever you say yes to him, and you just like, I'm going public. You don't know. But oh, the places you'll go. But I do know that you know this. You know he deserves 100% total sold-out commitment to him because of what he has done for you. That's why, like Chantilly said, you just want to scream it from the rooftop. You want the world to know that you stand with Jesus, though you commit to being baptized. It's like putting on the wedding ring so that not only you remember, but you show other people, I'm not ashamed to be a part of this relationship with Jesus. Just like I could take this ring off, I'm still going to be married because it's not the ring that makes me married. It's the commitments. The ring is there to show the commitments I've already made. Ephesians 2, 9 and, uh, 2 8 and 9 says, it's by grace you've been saved. Sandy referred to grace. It's only by grace. It's not about how many good things we do that, that, that makes us a Christ follower. Baptism doesn't make you a Christ follower. It shows that you are one. Because it's by grace you've been saved. It's through your faith into Jesus. It's not from yourself. It's a gift. You can't earn a gift. As soon as you earn it, it's not a gift. The gift of God is not by your works or good deeds. And the reason for that is so that nobody can boast because the only one who can boast about it is Jesus. Baptism is not something you do to get to heaven. Baptism is not something that you do to help somebody else get into heaven. Baptism is not something you do to your kids when they're babies. The bottom line is, baptism is a choice. It is to suit up with Jesus. It is a choice, a commitment to let Jesus lead your life. It is a simple act of obedience to God. The water doesn't make you a Christ follower. It shows that you already are one. Like my wedding ring shows that I am married. Baptism is the outward display of an inward commitment. And now, we're to that spot. All of these. In fact, I would invite all five of you, even while I'm still talking. Y'all come on up here. And get back in your seat, would you please? All of these people are going public with what they believe. Because you heard their testimony. You heard their story. They profess their faith in Christ prior to this day. But today they are celebrating that new life in Christ and they're going public. I'm so grateful that they've been so bold to tell their stories. But y'all, 
Now it all comes down to this. Yay! They want to put on the uniform, the ID tag, and the wedding ring of the Christian life today. Now one more thought before we actually do all this, and then we're going to sing a song and we'll be done. Hmm. I've told you all this, not just to explain what they're doing, but maybe for you to give consideration to what you need to do. Because you might have heard me say uh, and understood that what I'm talking about is that baptism is an inside job. And you're thinking, well, how does that happen? How does that happen to me? Where can I find the power to change my life? What do I have to do to become a Christian? What do I have to do to become a Christ follower? And it all boils down, honestly, to two words. And you're going to choose one of these words, and you're going to live it out. The first word is do. D-O, do. And if you choose this word, what you're saying is, I'm going to try to keep on doing. I'm going to do good things. And if I do enough good things, then hopefully they will outweigh all the bad things I do. And then maybe God will see all the good things that I do, and he will let me into heaven. A couple of things you need to think about if this is going to be your word. How do you know you've done enough good things? I'm just asking, and you need to ask yourself, who is keeping score? Here's another thing. If heaven is a perfect place, and God is perfect, and he cannot tolerate sin, but he absolutely loves sinners. If heaven is a perfect place, and only perfect people get to go there, then that means in order to get there, you can't have made any mistakes. So besides who's keeping score, you have to answer honestly. What's your score? This is why I call us a colossal collection of moral foul-ups, because you don't need to forget where we're standing. But you have another word. Here's another word. Second word is the word done. D-O-N-E, done. If you live out this word, what you are saying is, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has already done everything that is needed. For me to have forgiveness of all my sin, mistakes, and evil. And to be made right with God. He has already done all of that. It's done. It's already done that he has guaranteed me a home in heaven. Even though I am not perfect. But I get in on his ticket because he is perfect. Because he's already done all that is necessary. I simply accept his free gift of forgiveness that he has already bought, and I follow his lead from here on out. You have a choice. It's either do or it's done. If you want to become a Christ follower, I'm begging you, at least give consideration to stop doing stuff in order to earn favor with God and just rest In Jesus, it's called grace that he's done everything that is necessary. And all you need to do is ask, would you please apply what you have done to my account? Wow. Mm -mm -mm. Start relying on what Jesus has already done for you. You glad you're here today? (laughs) You're about to be even better. I'm thrilled to be a part of this time. And we're going to pray and then we're going to get in the water. Because through Christ, God is truly doing something fantastic around here. He's still changing lives today. These guys are going to go public. This is going to go by so fast. Kind of like a wedding. I told you all this. You plan and you plan and then you plan and then it's over. But I'm very, very, very proud of you. Live for Jesus. Okay? All right. Heavenly Father, take this time. Make it something fantastic that we remember, especially them. That they remember it. And that they keep on keeping on, that they keep taking steps of faith and trusting you in every, every area of their life, Lord. Help us to just be full of joy in this celebration because it is wonderful. Thank you for giving us new life, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to baptize. We'll sing one more song, okay?
Terry, because of your profession of faith in Jesus as your forgiver and leader, it is my honor to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are buried with him in baptism. Because of your profession of faith in Christ as your forgiver and leader, it is my privilege to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism. Tim, because you have professed your faith in Christ as your forgiver and leader, it is my privilege to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with him in baptism and raised up to walk with <laughs> ago and I'm so thrilled I get to baptize her because of your profession of faith in Christ as your forgiver and leader. My privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism. <laughs> your faith in Christ as your forgiver and leader, it is my pleasure to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are buried with him in baptism. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came to church today? Amen. Okay.